off, I would like to extend a great, warm NWDC welcome to Admiral Mustang. didn't really say is that uh, I was ended up 50-50 in the Atlantic and the Pacific. So when I would go out to the uh, Pacific for duty, they'd say, here comes that bathtub sailor. <laughs> and then when I'd come back to the Atlantic, they'd say, here comes that guy with a hayseed behind his ear. He doesn't know anything about NATO. And so I managed to stay one jump ahead of the sheriff in both fleets, and uh, here I am. We're going to have a little intro here. I want to tell you that this uh, presentation is classified X-ray, meaning it's for adults only. <laughs> and you will hear some views expressed by me that are obviously not the position of the Department of the Navy, the Department of Defense, <laughs> or the Office of Management and Budget. Okay, we have the first slide, please. I'm going to let you read these slides. I'm not going to read them to you. And I'll discuss the points that are on them as we go through. The background for this slide is that the Soviet Union had no maritime history to speak of, no traditions as we do. The last time they sent their fleet to sea, in 1905, they got their butts kicked by the Japanese fleet and lost two-thirds of their navy in a single battle at the Straits of Tsushima. So they were totally dominant in Europe, but could not expand really the way they wanted to because they were stymied at sea. So they embarked on a really clever and sophisticated program specifically designed to confront the U.S. Navy which they had to do because of the Euro same kind of bureaucratic problems that we have in our Defense Department. The rocket forces and the Army didn't want to spend a lot of money on the Navy. So a guy named Gorshkov, who was the Soviet CNO during my entire career, from Ensign to Admiral, was a combination sort of of Mahan and Arlie Burke, and Rick Over, a great man, probably the greatest sailor of the 20th century. Finally forced out of power at the end of his life, didn't even get a burial spot in the Kremlin War, but nonetheless he transformed the Soviet Navy from a coastal defense force to a maritime global presence, and he did this below our radar till very late in the game. <coughs> so the problem for us was that this line they were putting about, about keep out zones and uh, we got to restrict this and we got to restrict that, was seized upon by all the guys with leather patches on their elbows and people like that and viewed as, uh, you know, just a normal course of events for the Soviets. And it was pretty late in the game before we found out just what the hell was going on. Next slide, please. You go back to the end of World War II, and we were standing over the world's oceans like the Colossus of Rhodes. We had swept the seas of enemy navies, there were no more fleets to conquer, so we didn't need to have sea control. No one could contest us at all from going to point A to point B, which is what the definition of sea control is. So we were there, and because we no longer had a sea control problem, we turned to power projection. And we pursued that through the Korean War and through the Vietnam War. And then all of a sudden, we woke up to the fact that, my God, the Soviets have got a Navy that can challenge us. And we've got to do something about it. 
So Bud Zumwalt, the CNO, recognized this and he determined that sea control historically and then was the basic enabler for power protection. Namely, if you can't go from point A to B, how the hell are you going to project power from point B? In order to go from point A to point B, we had to be able, the Navy's end of the uh, strategic uh, bargain with NATO was the flanks, but we had to get to Europe to resupply it, and that was a problem. Now, while all this was going on, this strategic sort of uh, mishmash, things were changing, and you can see some of those now. And I used to say that the changes in the last 35 years greater than all the changes in all the centuries before, combined. There's a list of a few of them. We had heroes back then, you know, that were releasing classified material in the Pentagon Papers, and uh, I'm getting to the stage where I've never seen anything I haven't seen before. But there it is. And those are the same sorts of changes that the leaders of the Navy and the leaders of the Defense Department are facing today. They can be solved, but they take a lot of time, effort, and study. Next slide, please. I put this up just for a couple of reasons. The first is, you have to understand that we're all prisoners of our culture and environment and background. When a sailor looks at the globe, he sees the oceans. When the Army looks at the globe, they see the land. When the Air Force looks at the globe, they see the space covering it. And that basic view of the world dominates any strategic moves that are made. We used to have this saying, well, the waters of the world cover two-thirds of the, or three-quarters of the world, and so we got to have a lot of Navy. We, we got away with that for a couple of years. And then the army started saying, well, that may be true, but all the wars are fought on land. So we need a big army. And the Air Force was saying, wait a minute, there's an envelope over the whole world. We need a big Air Force. With the result that the defense budget, plus or minus a couple of percentage points, always remains one-third, one-third, one-third among the services. No getting around it. Now, at the start of all this drama, we depended on something in the NATO strategy, which was a stepchild to NATO, which was a fence across the GI-UK gap. And you can see part of that here. The, the plan was that we would put captor mines and submarines in the gap. We knew that the Soviets would never try to come down through the English Channel. And so we put captor mines and submarines and SOSA stations across that gap, and fighter aircraft in Iceland. The SOSA system was worldwide. It was a low-frequency uh, hydrophone collection. It had shore stations all over the world. The name SOSA was classified. The locations of the shore terminals were top secret. And the Soviets penetrated all that, and so we periodically would see Soviet trawlers out there dragging, trying to cut our cables. In the meantime, the submarines were getting closer and closer, and quieter and quieter, more and more. And now today, this formerly top secret system is history. They don't have it anymore. At the same time, the Soviets were demonstrating that they could fly bombers, backfires, bears, down over the gap as far south as Cuba, and then fly back up. So we had to station fighter aircraft from the UK and US and Iceland to deal with that threat. And we had to route our convoys, which we were required to get nine to Europe in 10 days from the start of hostilities way south and then back up. So uh, we had a strategy 
and it turned out it was uh, unexecutable. There was a difference between the stated strategy and the real world strategy. Admiral Zumwalt saw the uh, need for this, and he changed the Navy. He had something called the high-low concept. He wanted to make the Navy relevant. He wanted to try to demonstrate that we could get nine convoys to uh, Europe in 10 days. Uh, and so he changed the Navy. Well, what that meant was, in terms of internal mechanisms, he invoked what he called the high-low mix. You had a bunch of low-mix ships, which were convoy escorts, and the rest of the Navy was high-mix. That was the cruisers, destroyers, carriers, and submarines. And he put most of the Navy's money into the low-mix. In order to fund the low mix, he cut the Navy in half, as you saw in the previous slide. But the monies saved from cutting the Navy in half never came back to the Navy. They came back to the National Tre the Treasury, which is the same thing that happens now. The laws are the same. So you had the Navy reduced from a 1,000 ships to the numbers you saw, and no payback for it. Got a lot of midnight basketball, a lot of that kind of stuff, but not return to the Navy. So this notion of recapitalizing the Navy, which is the current buzzwords about the way you talk about it, is foolish. It doesn't occur. You cut your forces, they're gleefully accepted, but you don't get the money back. Next slide, please. Now the NATO people, as you know, or don't know, did not really support what we call the flexible response strategy. That is, they didn't want to have another war in which Europe was the battleground. So they were entirely happy, and I'm generalizing here, with a strategy that said the next war is going to be a nuclear exchange between the Soviet Union and the United States, and we're not going to have our towns, cities, and farms destroyed by a protracted land campaign. That uh, caused problems. As you can see, the Sack Lance, Supreme Allied Commander at Atlantic, who was always a U.S. naval officer, said there were a hundred ships so short of being able to execute the convoy strategy. There was no system for resupply or delivery. The strategy that I outlined to you assumed a friendly Norway, and what you did with the naval forces in the Atlantic was very, I mean, in the Mediterranean was very fuzzy. Sack Yor kept saying, if I don't get the forces I need in 10 days, I go nuke, tactically. And we discovered to our horror that the Soviets didn't share that view of nuclear war. In other words, a tact nuke fired against the Soviet tank division is going to result in the loss of New York and uh, uh, U.S. cities like that. And we used to have big war games where the big shots then, the principals played themselves. I was in a lot of these. And one of the current cabinet officials would come and play the president. And one of the arguments they used to put forth in the specific case, for example, of the Pacific, is they would say in the private sessions, now look, someday China is going to come to the president of the United States and he's going to say, we're tired of all this falter all about Taiwan. That's our country. And we're going to take it back. And if you try to stop us or interfere, you're going to lose the West Coast. And the, the official who told us this then said, what do you think the President of the United States is going to do when that question is asked to him? Do you think he's going to support mutual assured destruction in order to protect an island far away that people don't even know the name of? We used to call it Formosa. 
That was a problem. It's still a problem, by the way. Anyway, Europeans were happy because no matter what we said publicly, and they agreed to publicly, they knew privately that we couldn't do it. And so if Sakir did what he wanted to do in Europe, which was go nuke to make up with firepower and the lack of forces, that the Soviets would respond uh, with international means. Next slide, please. Now, all of a sudden, we were faced with the discovery of the bastions, that the Soviet submarines would no longer pour out into the Atlantic. They would go back up to protect their boomers, stationed in the vicinity of the Kola Peninsula, which was the Norfolk of the Soviet Union, largest base in the, in the world. So that threw a real wrinkle into our strategy. And because now we didn't need this fence, there was nobody trying to get through it. At the same time, the dominant threat to resupply uh, became Soviet naval aviation, which was these long-range bombers. Then, Sakyur, pushed by a bunch of very smart senior U.S. naval officers, who several of whom became four-star officers, said that uh, the background of that was they heard the things that Sakyur was saying. They recognized the things that Sack Lance in succession were saying. They concluded that our present strategy could lead only to uh, intercontinental nuclear exchange wanted to pull back to make sure that their boomers survived to do that, raised the tension level in the planning circles a lot. So that your study said that they can take Norway in three days. And they can do that, and we will have about 14 days of time to respond to the threats which we could identify that this was going to occur and then Norway was going to be gone. The Norwegians didn't like that <coughs> because the basic NATO strategy said none of the 16 nations are going to give up a centimeter of ground to the Soviet Union. So here now we had a strategy that uh, said, well, but we're going to give them up Norway in three days. So that's when I started looking into this. Uh, I went up to brief the Norwegian big shots, including the Sec Def, who later became uh, the Prime Minister of Norway, with an idea that we ought to go up there and take Navy aircraft to change the tide of the war ashore so that the Battle of the Atlantic could be won. The way we would do that would be with carrier air because the Air Force had said for years, hey, don't worry about uh, air superiority in Norway. We'll just transland a bunch of aircraft. Well, it turned out there weren't enough airfields in uh, Norway to support even a fraction of that airlift required. So I commissioned a study at uh, Striking Fleet done by a guy who worked, he was my OEG rep. One of the lessons there is if you've got OEG reps at hand, use those guys and you'd be amazed at the results you can get. Anyway, we took the SACUR study. We added a carrier to the forces up there and it was we still lost. So then we added another carrier and it was a toss-up. And we added three carriers and we won. Next slide, please. Now, this was a substantive conclusion. Next slide, please. What happened then is, uh, let's say we want to do that. How do we do it? What tactics do we need? And this is where I really started to see the close linkage between overall strategies 
and deck plate actions. How in the hell are we going to survive up there? Well, I remembered that in World War II, you all know the story of the Bismarck, which got out and uh, was a celebrated incident in World War II, but not many people know that the Bismarck had a sister ship, the Turpins, and it went up and hid in the fjords in Norway, and it took the United Kingdom 600 sorties to find it, much less to put it out of action. So I was thinking, hey, is there some modern counterpart of that? And I said, we ought to go up there and see if we can fly in the fjords, and the radar shadowing will help us with the AAW, which is now the principal threat, because since they've pulled back their submarines, the only threat that can saturate our defenses is the air threat. We'll get in there and the mountains will protect us. So uh, I went up to brief the Norwegians. Well, they had a lot of doves, you know, as usual, and they were saying, hey, you know, this is a defensive strategy and uh, you can't do this kind of stuff. John Lehman helped by saying, hey, look, we're not going to lob A6s into the Kremlin. We're coming up there to defend Norway. And nothing in the present NATO strategy does that. And we're going to defend you guys by defeating the Soviets. And in order to do that, we got to be able to fly in your fjords where we get protection and we can seal them off. Well, the aviators were saying, well, here's another black shoe with a bunch of wild ass ideas. What's he know about carrier here? And, uh, so I got a guy who had. Uh, magnificent credentials. Paul Ilg, he was a very junior aviation rear admiral. He had been shot down in Vietnam and evaded in the jungles of Laos for a week before they went in and picked him up and brought him out. So Paul had uh, impeccable credentials in the aviation community. He was by no means a wild-eyed black shoe. He said, It'll be a piece of cake to fly out of there. And that settled that argument. Yeah, right. Anyway, it settled it with the aviators. So we said, uh, we'll go up there and see if we can do it. Now, the idea was that the radar shadowing would change the AAW problem from bullet at bullet to bullet at aircraft because they had these missiles that they could shoot from airplanes that had nuclear warheads in some cases from 200 miles out. And we were unable, if, if you wanted to have enough cap on station 200 miles out, you had to start deck shooting that cap when the threat was a thousand miles away. So that meant when these airplanes lifted off in the Kola Peninsula, we got to start launching massive air efforts to shoot them down before they can reach the 200 miles. So we got up there and we had gotten hold of the best Soviet uh, radars uh, that uh, governed the use of their air-to-ground missiles because uh, those missiles were lock-on before launch, meaning you couldn't fire it from the airplane until you had a target and you had locked on it. We found that when we got in among the fjords with their surrounding mountains, not only was that a problem for their radars, they could not get a lock on until the aircraft was within the minimum range of the missile launched from 20,000 feet. That is, they couldn't fire. In the meantime, if we stationed our SAM ships and our CAP, smartly, which we knew how to do, we would be shooting at their airplanes that were coming in closer and closer, and not at their bullets. And incidentally, in all of these uh, engagement models and ICMs and all that stuff, there's a basic lesson for the Navy. If you rely on precision-guided weapons and fancy new toys to handle your problems, like ABMs, you got to consider that as a magazine problem. And when 
You go up against the Soviet Union, for example, with a couple of hundred of Sam 3s, you win the first day's engagement, but they got a magazine that is the size of the whole damn country, and we're out of weapons. So if you want to go to that strategy, the first thing you got to do is buy the stuff and have it in inventory. And we have never done that with any of our precision-guided weapons. That's a lesson for the present leadership of the Navy, and you guys ought to all ponder on that. Anyway, next slide, please. Up goes the America, with the results that uh, you see. Uh, incidentally, this bioluminescence is something that when you wave your hand through the water, you see a little trail. And it occurs at various spots in the world. It happens to occur with regularity in the fjords. I flew in a helicopter over a 688, which was at 60 feet. And I could see that ship outlined in uh, illumination, including seeing the prop turn. So one of the lessons was if you're going to get in close and you want to play the ASW game, put your forces in a place where there's bioluminescence. That uh, information used to be classified top secret. Incidentally, all the stuff I'm telling you is in my oral history and the history that other guys have written. So there's nothing presently classified in what I say, except for the need to think about all this stuff and how you saw it. Anyway, here we had gone up there, we tested, we canceled the air threat, sealed off the fjords, the aviators say we can fly as many sorties we want to out of a bus fjord and others. The king comes out to attend the brief brief. It was in a big snowstorm and we were really worried about the king's safety. We, I kept calling and his uh, Royal Headquarters and say, hey, I don't think he ought to come out here. But in the meantime, they were saying, well, the king's already taken off in his helicopter. And about the time of the last call, the helo landed. Off comes the king. The guy who was such a Navy enthusiast that he always wore his admiral's uniform to all the NATO functions, no matter whether they were Army or Air Force or whatever. He comes in in a great coat. I take him into my cabin while we're setting up to brief all these big shots. He says, we've got to have a little something to warm up. He takes this bottle of liquor out of his coat. I said, your majesty, uh, this is a US naval vessel, and uh, we don't permit that at the time we did it. He said, you don't understand, young man. He said, wherever I am is Norwegian territory by the laws of our country. You are in Norwegian waters and I order you to have a drink or two with me. <laughs> what are you going to say? <laughs> anyway, uh, he loved it. Because he could see that we were going to offend them, and defend his country. <coughs> now let's take a look at uh, what happened after all this. We got an answer. It's no cost. We can do it. Let's get with it. Right? Wrong. Two years to sell. Two years to sell. You know, uh, the fighting in OPNAV between essentially the submariners and the aviators, everything being a zero sum game in that city. If somebody wins, somebody else loses. The Congress was worried about this offensive posture. Admiral Sharp had told me uh, when I was his flag lieutenant during the Vietnam War that no war in history has ever been won by a strictly defensive strategy. And any strategy, no matter what purpose, has to have offensive elements. So my answer to all the doves who were saying, oh my god, this is uh, disruptive and it's offensive, I was saying, baloney, we're there to defend Norway. We got offensive elements of that strategy, but that's what we have to do if we want to defend Norway, and the king of Norway says he wants us to do it. Well, that took two years to get that uh, notion through the Washington bureaucracy. 
out of that, I started figuring out how to write to tell people what to do, and that led to my fighting instructions. Instructions, and all of this was the first step in what's now called matorial warfare. Next slide, please. I'm getting close to the end. I know you're all going to sleep. There are a bunch of things that haven't changed since then. This I'm talking about now almost 40 years ago. Arlie Burke has a dictum, which you ought to all pay attention to. He says, all the country demands from the Navy is two things. In war or time, you must win battles. In peacetime, you must win the arguments. Not a bad summation of what the country needs. In any case, these are some things that I think haven't changed. <coughs> We got to have leaders. We got to have people who lay it out and come in with wild ideas and then we'll prove them. When you get into a situation where the CNO says publicly that his major concern is sexual harassment, and Sink Pack makes public statements about, well, my biggest concern is weather, you got to, and the press meantime is riding herd on you, and there's a usual gotcha relationship. You got to sit down and look at what you're doing and what you're talking about. All that stuff's a problem, always has been, and it's never going to go away. We got to be able to state clearly a requirement for naval power and naval force, and the people who lead the Navy have to be just as accomplished in the corridors of power as they are on the bridge. Okay, the last slide, please. End of World War II, we were a power projection Navy. While we concentrated on power projection through two wars, the Soviets snuck up on us. And we were faced with trying to rebuild a sea-controlled Navy in a very serious fiscal environment. Now, let me give you an indication of what I mean by serious. We have a class of ships in the Navy called the Spruance class, 31 of them. The original plan under the McNamara regime, of which I was in Abdam at the time, was to have 60 ships constructed. Half of them would be ASW ships, the Spruance. The other half would be guided missile ships to handle the air threat. So the Spruance, you could walk a mile on the decks of that ship and you couldn't find a weapon. The 30 ASW ships had a weapon system that preceded Aegis called Typhon. Typhon's costs got out of control and McNamara canceled the ASW version of the Spruance class package. Now we had a bunch of ASW ships with no weapons at all to do anything offensive and without any aircraft cover. So we had a problem. We had a problem because of the fiscal environment. Second problem during the Jimmy Carter administration was this absolute nonsense that you can run the Defense Department like a business. He had done something called zero-based budgeting when he was governor of Georgia. That is, every year, you reevaluated every program in detail, and those that weren't coming well, you just canceled. If you were building a road and it wasn't on schedule or the, the traffic patterns changed, you stopped building the road. You can't do that with a carrier. We found when we got into this, in order to change or cancel the Spruance contract, it would cost us more to change the contract than it would to build the last 15 ships of the class. That's the kind of stuff we were dealing with. So we now have a sort of a sea control Navy. We have the high mix of the Navy, Bud Zumwalt's idea, eroding carrier numbers going down, 
Some Walt numbers way down, new cruiser up in the air. The low mix is taking the money that you need for the high mix. So the LCS, on a very capable little ship in its own right, isn't as capable as a carrier. It isn't as capable as a cruiser. But the more of them you build, the less you're going to build of the high. And that realism never seems to sink in in the Navy. So it's got to sink in this time. You know, we, we've got to have the high mix in order to enable the low mix in order to do sea control. And how this affects the pivot to the Pacific is, in my view, an unknown. How do we go back from a power projection Navy to a sea control Navy? What does sea control in the Pacific mean? What is the overall national strategy in the Pacific? We had an overall strategy in NATO. The fact that it was a loser and couldn't be executed uh, had nothing to do with it. We had a strategy. <coughs> which could get you through a congressional briefing or two, but that was about the... Yeah. So we ought to think about the fact that when you go to a de facto high mix Navy, the low mix always ends up dominating because it costs a lot less. But you can't really state what the why you're doing that. One time, I got a lesson in that, when in a period of time, John Stennis, who was a congressional hero, a senator, who in my view embodied every possible characteristic that the country demands of its public services, a real gentleman, somebody who really understood the military. And I was the Navy's point man with Senator Stennis, who at one point, because of deaths and things, became both the head of the Senate Armed Services Committee and the Senate Appropriation Committee at the same time. Pretty important guy. So I'm going over to him trying to sell the FFG7 program. And he says to me, I'd like to talk to you about this uh, privately afterwards. And I go and he said, uh, listen, uh, he said, uh, I don't like the way you're doing this. You're talking about building these ships to run convoys to Europe, and I don't think we're going to do that because of the nuclear backdrop. He said, I would really like to be able to approve the program, but I need you to come in with rationale to have those ships required to defend the United States. Great chance to say, yes, sir. I went back, we did a series of detailed analyses over the next year, and I went back to it. The numbers were the same, the yearly appropriations were the same, but this time these ships were required to guarantee the continued import of all the strategic and commercial materials that we would always need to maintain the structure of our society. He said, I love it, the program's approved. Not bad, not bad. So what you need to do is you need to figure out how to state a requirement. And that requirement has got to be stated in Dick and Jane language. Run, spot, run. So that when you go over to brief very busy people who have other competing interests on their mind, they at least understand what the hell you're saying and what you're trying to do. And I'll just tell you that uh, by I no longer have access to classified material. Fortunately, I gave up on my clearances a while ago. So I'm not familiar with the details, but the public, if I'm part of the public, does not yet understand what's happening to the Navy and what the consequences are. And it's only the Navy that's going to develop the requirements that will be supported by the American public in order to prevent losing our ability to control the seas and all that that unravels with it. So the people in this room are part of the people. They've got to come up with those answers. 
You saw that list of stuff I showed you that changed on my watch. It's no different on yours. And if there isn't a national strategy, strategy to support what you do in the Pacific, you've got to invent one. There, there was no NATO strategy that had anything similar to taking the fleet to the Norwegian fjords and, and shooting down all their backfires. So it's up to the Navy. The requirement's up to you all. I wish you luck. Watch out for China. I used to, when I was uh, in Opnav, my last tour, one of my friends was Comrade Mu. Chinese, who then had no officer structure. Comrade Mu was a great fan of the Redskins, and we used to have dinner at each other's home. Lucy was uh, forced to eat thousand-year-old eggs, which are one time, Admiral Mu said to Lucy, uh, Mrs. Mustin, uh, don't you love these uh, thousand-year-old eggs? They're a great delicacy. She tried to choke this thing down and said, oh, they're delicious. Snapped his finger and she had another helping instant. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I used to talk to Admiral Mu about uh, all this stuff, and I'd say, now, what the hell are you guys doing in the Saras uh, Paracels and other places in the Pacific? And with a straight face, he would say, well, we're just trying to establish coding spaces, as you did during Teddy Roosevelt's watch, so that we can protect our commercial interests. <laughs> and then a couple of days later, they announced they had re restored the rank structure in the Chinese armed forces, and that Comrade Mu became Admiral Mu. So they had a little party. In the meantime, as I said, he was a great Redskins fan. I had a little party and I gave him a Redskins coffee mug. And he had tears in his eyes. He's a Chinese apple. You know, a, a veteran of a lot of internal wars and struggles. And he said, I will cherish this forever, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was a very moving and fun way to have a nice relationship with that's the end of my pitch. Good luck. Pass the football to you guys. Anybody has any questions, uh, I'd be delighted to answer. Yes, sir, we've got time for about one or two questions, if you're okay. Any questions? You actually answered my question, sir, which is what will be our next biggest threat to look for, and it's China. And then you also coupled that with uh, you know, incorporating the LCS and how the LCS fits into not only just the purchase structure and the acquisition cycle, but how we need to be open and looking at how we incorporate it into our concept of operation. Absolutely. So the, you, you answered mine before I got a chance to ask. So, so if there's any other questions out there? Anything online? Thank you. I, I couldn't hear that. Sir. Is it your reference for Admiral Burke quote saying that peace we must win the argument? Given the guidance, what capabilities should we be arguing for? Should we still be building for sea control, Navy, and we have something altogether all different? Well, what we have now is a power projection Navy because that's all we needed when the Soviet Union went away. And we won't need to be able to determine again as cleanly as we could then what the strategic problem was. I mean, uh, is the backdrop we're gonna invade China? Well, hell no, we're not. So we need to have a clarity of thought as to what in the hell you want from the Navy in the Pacific. My view is, Navy ought to take John Stennis's thought, but we need the Navy to protect na U.S. national interests worldwide. And if we're not strong enough to do that, then we're going to have impacts on our society and our quality of life that are going to be disastrous. Now, the I've seen the CNO's latest pitch about covering all the strike. Uh, choke points in the Pacific. 
you want to cover a choke point, that's not that's easier said than done. The Sixth Fleet, for example, for years was advertised as the fleet without a base. So there's a way to structure a navy that uh, can operate and stay at sea for years without a base. That's the first thing. It's a logistics problem. Now, if you want to control choke points like the Straits of Malacca, you got to control the land there. You got to have a place where you can rearm and refuel from. You got to have access to those ports, and they got to be secured. In most countries, when you say we'd like you to perform this function for us, they say, "What are you going to do for us?" And we say, hey, "Glad you asked." We'll bring you in under our umbrella and we'll defend you. That's what we said to the NATO people and what we said to Japan and still do. Yeah, well, pretty soon they're going to start saying, well, okay, what are you going to defend us with? Gee, the LCS. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> well, that's enough of that one. <laughs> well, sir, I can't thank you enough. Your presentation was masterful mix of bringing history and you know like lessons learned that are not lessons learned until we make some action out of them but you can take your presentation today and change the name of the platforms change the name of the politicians change the name of the countries and the tactics and exactly what we're facing today exactly. so thank you very much for your time and I've got one of our uh, illustrious uh, NWDC uh, icebergs for you today sir and I just can't thank you enough sir so thank you very much for being here Thank you.